What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taron Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. And as always, we have ourselves a jam-packed show as we have a lot to get into in the world of volleyball, such as UCLA taking down Grand Canyon not once, but twice. Can the Bruins continue their hot play going into the MPSF tournament next week? And can they clinch the number one seed against Concordia Irvine this upcoming week? Also, Long Beach State took care of CSUN. And how about UC Irvine knocking off Hawaii? Did they get two for the price of one? Or was it a split on split? Also, how about the Masters College reverse sweeping Pepperdine? And they also took care of business against Menlo in conference play. So you have that. The San Diego Mojo looked really impressive last week, being the Columbus Fury and the Omaha Supernovas. Corona Del Mar took down Newport Harbor last week. How did those Sea Kings sink the Sailors? And what else happened in the world of volleyball? Hand me a volleyball. Set up the net. Because I'm about to serve you up some volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Taron Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. Thank you all for joining me on this beautiful Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Monday wherever you are listening from. Either way, you have made your way into episode 241 of Set Point. And without any further delay, let us begin. But first and foremost, Set Point would not be live on Spreaker without IE Sports Radio providing the platform. Please do follow IE Sports Radio on several different social media platforms such as X, formerly known as Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. We also have a Facebook page. All you just have to do is type in the word IE Sports and Radio in the search bar, like us, and then that's how you're able to follow us on Facebook. We also have a website, IESportsRadio.com, for all of your latest sports news, our blog, our Hall of Fame, our Fans of the Month, our pages dedicated to each podcast, such as Setpoint, our community forum, and our merchandise shop. For the last nine years, I Sports Radio has been bringing you amazing content, ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel, to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports teams around the country. Thank you to everyone for all of your support and for making I Sports Radio your direct feed for all that sports. A huge shout out to our sponsor, sponsors for that matter. Plant Jerky Premium Brisket Beef Jerky is the first sponsor. Plant Jerky is the official jerky of the 2022 California League champion Lake Elsinore Storm, the single-A affiliate of the San Diego Padres. This all-brisket jerky has gluten-free options, contains no MSG, no sodium nitrate, it's low in sugar, and high in protein. This is some of the best jerky you can get your hands on, and all I have to do is visit plantjerky.net and place your order. In addition, Prices are slashed for the time being, and if you buy $50 or more worth of an order, you'll get it shipped for free. Once again, a huge shout out to our sponsor, Plant Jerky Premium Brisket Beef Jerky, the jerky that's on a whole other planet. Our second sponsor is Seal the Deal Wax Seals by Cecilia B. You just finished your very own wedding or baby shower invitations, and you're looking for that extra special touch. Maybe you just wrote a letter to a relative or friend and you want to add their smile when they receive it. If that's the case, then seal the deal with Cecilia's handmade sealing wax stamps for your invitations, letters, and gifts is just for you. You bring the deal, we'll bring the seal. Follow them on Instagram at seal the deal underscore wax stamps. And the way you can follow Set Point on social media is on X, formerly known as Twitter, at set underscore point IESR. And you can follow Set Point on Instagram, at set underscore point IESR. You can follow me, Taron Rodriguez, on X, formerly known as Twitter, which is where I'm mainly active, at Taron Rodriguez 1. Also, if you're listening live on Spreaker, you will notice there is a support button. And if you're listening on the playback on Spreaker, there's a support button. If you want to become a supporter of Set Point on IE Sports Radio, it costs five dollars a month. This will get you access to past interviews not posted on Instagram at set underscore point IESR and future episodes of Set Point Extra Points, which are video interviews with volleyball coaches, players, and anyone involved in the sport of volleyball. 
But with all that said and done, let us begin as Ralph Kalise, Jen B, and Ricky Keeler all say good evening, have a great show. Thank you. Thank you, you three. I appreciate it. All right, now let's get on into the volleyball action. So we have to start with some NCAA men's volleyball as that was the last week of the season without any conference tournaments as this week begins the MIVA conference tournament. All right, so obviously we have to recap the Grand Canyon UCLA series. The first one, it was a rather surprising sweep. I didn't think that UCLA was going to sweep Grand Canyon, honestly. Honestly, I thought Grand Canyon left a lot of meat on the bone with this first matchup, as they had no players in double digits and kills, and UCLA had 10 kills from Grant Sloan, of all players. Yeah, it wasn't players like Cooper Robinson or Ethan Champlin or Alex Knight leading the way. Matter of fact, Alex Knight wasn't really involved too much offensively, as Sloan led the way with 10 kills. UCLA hit 441 while holding Grand Canyon to only 203 in terms of hitting percentage. The stat where UCLA really shined were the blocks. They had 12 blocks as a team compared to Grand Canyon's 2.5. And, and they also dominated the serve game for the most part. UCLA had 8 aces to Grand Canyon 6, which is a rarity because Grand Canyon serves the ball really well. So a very quick sweep as the Bruins won 25-16, 25-22, and 25-19. Other than the second set, it wasn't really surprising. Now the second matchup between the Lopes and the Bruins was a lot more fun and dramatic. Grand Canyon won the first set 26-24, followed by UCLA winning the next two sets in close fashion, 25-22 and 25-23. Then Grand Canyon jumped out to an early lead. It was a 6-2 lead. They never looked back as the Lopes took the fourth set 25-18. But in the fifth set, it was neck and neck early on in the set, but UCLA kicked it into high gear once they crossed the halfway mark as they wound up winning the fifth set 15-8. And UCLA... They're now in the lead in the MPSF conference standings, and they're pretty much on the verge of clinching the one seed because this week they have Concordia Irvine, who's the last place team in the MPSF, while Grand Canyon would have to hope that UCLA loses out and then they have to win out as they host Pepperdine this weekend. The Bruins were led by Merrick McHenry, who had 14 kills. He hit 522. Ethan Champlin had 12 kills. Grant Sloan added 8 kills. UCLA hit 312 as a team, even though Grand Canyon hit 377. So even though Grand Canyon had a hitting percentage of 377, the Bruins just found a way to keep on Brew winning. Hence the title of the show, UCLA Keeps on Brew Win. UCLA also had 10 aces compared to Grand Canyon's two. Grand Canyon did not serve all that well in this ma- in this series altogether. Like, this one was probably the one that took the cake or made the cake go rotten as it, Grand Canyon actually dominated in most of the other categories. Like, blocking, they had 10 blocks as a team compared to UCLA's eight. UCLA also got out dug by three, 42 to 39. So it's a little surprising to see Grand Canyon coming up on the wrong side of the spectrum in terms of the wins and wins and losses. So my takeaway for Grand Canyon is this. This was a total missed opportunity because even if they salvaged a split against UCLA, they still would have been ahead of the Bruins. By one game, yes. Would UCLA have the tiebreaker? Yes. But at the very least, Grand Canyon would have needed, would have controlled its own destiny. Now UCLA controls its own destiny, and it's looking like Grand Canyon is going to be playing in the opening round. Albeit it will be against Concordia, but that's still not really the most ideal thing for the Lopes. But for the Bruins, I'm just going to say this. They were on their A game for the most part. I just got to say, this is what great teams do. This is what champions do. They find ways to win even against some of the better teams. And I'm just going to say this. Grand Canyon has not posted a win over a top 10 team. Food for thought right there in terms of consideration of of the at-larges. Speaking of top 5 teams, we had two more playing this past weekend as we had Hawaii and UC Irvine squaring off in the Brent Event Center. The number four Rainbow Warriors were looking to continue its winning ways after winning two in a row against UC Santa Barbara, while UC Irvine was coming off of a split against CSUN. The first match, I unfortunately did not have a chance to go to just because I was I was working and doing other things. But UC Irvine was able to sweep Hawaii 25-20, 25-19, and 25-21. 
Irvine surprisingly made this look so easy as Halir Heno led the way with 20 kills. That's when you know UC Irvine was on its A game. Hawaii was led by Alaka'i Todd, who had 12 kills. Keone Tim had 10 kills. But Hawaii only hit 204, which is a little concerning if you ask me. And they got blocked 10 blocks as a team to Hawaii's 3 blocks as a team. And the scary thing is, is that UCLA only had one ace, so you have that as well. But the second matchup, I was able to attend this second match, and let's just say Hawaii flipped the script. So the first set, UC Irvine wound up winning the first set, 25-22. But the second set, it was so tight as it was tied up at 21s and then 22s and then 23s. UC Irvine had set point at 24, 23, but Hawaii was able to tie it up. And then this was the key play right here. Nolan Flexen of UC Irvine unfortunately got hurt as he was diving for the ball, and then he hit his head or face planted, which really sucked. I, I mean, he had to come out and he had a little bit of a and he had to take a little bit of a breather before going back in. He missed the the rest of the second set, and unfortunately for David Niffin, he kind of put in a player with a little bit of inexperience. He was a freshman, and sadly, Hawaii just went after him in terms of serving the ball and hitting the ball. And unfortunately for UC Irvine, Hawaii took that second set 27-25. And that was the turning point because the rest of the way, Hawaii was able to, I I would pretty much say, control most of the match as they took the third and fourth set 25-18 and the match. Hawaii was led by Louis Sakanoko, who had 16 kills. Alaka'i Todd had 12 kills. But to me, I think the unsung heroes were Girhame Voss and Kurt Neuster, as they both combined for 15 kills in the middle. Keone Tim had 12 digs to go along with 8 kills. Tred Rosenthal had 9 digs to go along with 47 assists and 5 kills. Elu Choi also had some good hustle plays, as he had 6 digs. So my takeaway for Hawaii is this. This was kind of the match that Hawaii needed to build momentum because this week they're on the road against UC San Diego. But honestly, and one of my Hawaii fan followers kind of said this, it won't really matter in terms of seeding just because Hawaii is hosting the Big West Conference Tournament. And that is big right there just because we all know how Stan Sheriff Center can be. Now the takeaway for UC Irvine is this. Obviously, losing Nolan Flexen late does hurt them. But honestly, I think UC Irvine still has a chance to be an at-large. But this loss does them little to no favors. It also doesn't do them any favors because now their chances of winning the Big West Conference regular season title and getting the number one seed of the conference tournament, even though seeding doesn't matter, it just got a whole lot slimmer. And the only way that UC Irvine clinches the regular season and number one seed title of the Big West Conference is they got to beat Long Beach State twice. And Long Beach just swept CSUN, which they did so in pretty comfortable fashion. More on that a little bit later. But that was that for those four top five matchups. Now we got to go on into the MIVA. All started on Thursday. Ohio State pulled off a reverse sweep against McKendry at Kovali Center. It was a huge win for those Buckeyes as Jacob Pastor led the way with 15 kills. Shane Wetzel also had 11 kills. Justin Howard, he had 9 kills. For McKendry, Bryce Wetgen led the way with 21 kills. Kevin Shuley had 17 kills. I'm just going to also say this, though. I think this is the nature of the MIVA. This is obviously a great, great conference. This is probably the conference that is going to be the most unpredictable just because you have so many good teams. Heck, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw an upset regarding a top seed losing at home. And yes, Gen B, O-H-I-O. And I was just downright impressed when it came to that win. But it just goes to show that, in my opinion... Ohio State needed that one. They needed to win that one just because they need all the momentum that they can get in regards to the MIVA tournament. They're going to be the three seed. They locked up the three seed, but it's still pretty solid if you ask me. But we'll see what happens with the Buckeyes. So all in all for Ohio State, it was a big win for them. And I was pretty impressed by their resilience. I was thinking, okay, well, this one looks kind of like a reverse sweep, unfortunately. But... For Ohio State, I I had no doubt. And I just got to say, Jacob Pastor, even though they didn't have the monstrous kills, he still led the way, and he needs that 
to be that leader for Ohio State. That was that matchup for McKendry and Ohio State. That was the first of many matchups that happened in the MIVA this past week. Then we have number 20 Purdue Fort Wayne taking down Lewis in five in Fort Wayne. Now this was a pretty big win for Purdue Fort Wayne. They were back in the top 20 after having a a previous stint where they eventually lost to Queens, which obviously is not ideal for the Mastodons. But honestly, I really thought that Purdue Fort Wayne had a lot to prove. And I think they proved themselves when it came to this win. Now, Lewis isn't really the most consistent team, but they're better than they were last year. And they're a little bit more consistent than they were last season. As the Mastodons were led by John Diedrich, who had 23 kills. But the real leader was Mark Frazier, who had 24 kills. Carlos Mercado had 11 kills. Wilmer Hernandez had 13 digs. Purdue Fort Wayne hit 309 while holding Lewis to 262 as Max Roquet led the Flyers with 20 kills. Cyver Drolsom added 16 kills. Daniel Haber, 12 kills. Sean Baggs, 10 kills. Now, this makes me think that Purdue Fort Wayne is definitely going to be a threat to the MIVA. I think that Purdue Fort Wayne is not a bad team. And... The only reason why they're not the worst team in the MIVA or one of the worst teams is because of John Diedrich. That dude is a living legend. And he's definitely, I would go as far as to say he should be at least an All-American Honorable Mention. I think he could be an All-American Honorable Mention. But I will just say, I hope for their case that they at least get past round one. And then we had another MIVA upset. Well, this one wasn't an upset, but... It was another reverse sweep as McKendry, oh man, it was such a bad weekend to be a Bearcat as Ball State reverse swept McKendry as Ball State, oh gosh. Tanashi and Dava Zocheva, he was him. 27 kills, 449. What more can you say about Tanashi and Dava Zocheva? The Cardinals also hit 303 while holding McKendry to 297, which wasn't too bad. They also out Doug McKendry 42 to 37. The service ace battle was kind of won by Ball State. They had five to McKendry's two. McKendry just missed 20 serves, though. They missed 20 serves in this match compared to the Cardinals' 16. As the Bearcats were led by Bryce Wetgen, who had 15 kills. Kevin Shuley added 13 kills. McKendry eventually got the seventh seed in the MIVA tournament, which is not bad. I'll get into that a little bit later, but I'll also just say it could actually play out to working out for them. But more on that later. Then next we had USC and BYU. Now, BYU won the first meeting as this was played on Friday at Galen Center. They beat USC 22-25, 25-21, 25-19, and 25-13. Long story short for BYU, they honestly did not let the first set deter them. And that's kind of what good teams do. I think BYU is definitely a scary team. They have proven that they can win outside of Smithfield House in Provo, Utah. As the Cougars were led by Capono Brown, who had 17 kills. Mix Romanus and Luke Benson added 12 kills each. BYU also hit 370. Even though they only had three aces, their true stat where they shined was the block category, as they had 13 blocks compared to USC's 10. And then BYU basically outdug USC 30 to 16. USC only hit 167 as Dylan Klein led the way with 15 kills. That was kind of the only star player, as you kind of have to wonder where this is kind of where they miss Wes Smith. Now, I don't know what happened with Wes Smith, but I imagine he got hurt. And this is where they really miss Wes Smith. If Wes Smith is playing in that game, there's not a whole lot opposing teams can do. Because Wes Smith is 6'11", pretty much crossing 7 feet. But the second meeting between USC and BYU went a little bit better for the Trojans. As they wound up winning in 5. And they dodged multiple match points from the Cougars. And only needed one match point And wound up winning the 5th set, 18-16. Everyone's telling me, oh, there was some controversy. Well... BYU has got to learn to close out these teams. If BYU wants to go deep into the NCAA or in the MPSF tournament and possibly upset the likes of Grand Canyon and UCLA, they actually have to close out teams like USC. 
If they can't do that, then they're not going to the NCAA tournament, and they're not going to go far in the MPSF tournament. As USC was led by Noah Roberts, who had 19 kills. Now, here's the thing about Noah Roberts. He's a redshirt freshman. I actually got to see one of his matches back at Los Alamitos. This dude is phenomenal. I, it's unfortunate that last year he had to miss most of, if not all of last year. But Noah Roberts is showing his presence. And he helped take some pressure off of Dylan Klein and and Jack Duker and Riley Hayne and whatnot. Dylan Klein also had 16 kills. Kyle Paulson had 10 kills. As the the Trojans were able to make make it work with them and I was I was impressed by USC. I was after seeing the first match I was like, "Uh-oh, I don't think USC is has a chance with this one." But I think USC is so sneaky. Their problem is is that they're so young. If they can just get out of that young and rebuilding stage, they might have a chance to be something in the MPSF tournament. They're hosting the darn thing, so here's hoping that they can draw a big crowd. BYU was led by Capono Brown, who had 20 kills. Mix Romanus added 16 kills. Luke Benson, 15 kills. Gavin Julian had 11 kills. For the Cougars, my takeaway for them is... Uh, I mean, I feel they were going to be the three seed just because they had two losses to... Grand Canyon, and they had a loss to UCLA. I don't think they would have gotten the two seed. So they're cemented in that three seed in the MPSF tournament. They could see USC again, but now I'm starting to wonder, does USC actually have the formula to beat BYU? We'll see. And then this, now that we're talking about the MPSF, this was a big upset right here. Okay, let me just clarify. The Masters College is an NAIA school. Pepperdine is a top 10 team in the NCAA men's aspect of things the masters college defeated pepperdine in five sets it was actually a reverse sweep so we had a lot of reverse sweeps we had the kendry getting reverse swept twice i'm sorry to tell you that bearcat fans we had the masters college reverse sweeping pepperdine oh man this was such a big game and the masters college dodged multiple match points i want to say it was seven if not maybe nine but the Mustangs were able to plot that third... After losing the first two sets, I was just thinking to myself, well, the Masters College is giving Pepperdine some some sort of challenge. But it looks like Pepperdine might have that edge over them. But the Masters College took that third set 34-32, like I said, dodging multiple match points. Then the fourth set, the Mustangs took that fourth set 26-24, and eventually they took the fifth set 15-12, and it was a phenomenal win for the Mustangs. Their second NCAA win of the season. Their first one came at the hands of CSUN. I kept trying to tell y'all that was a good matchup to watch for. And indeed it was. Now many are saying that Pepperdine is not a, as great of, the, of a team as they were last year or in years past. But I just got to say it's still an upset. It's still a big win for the Masters College, even though they have a bunch of stacked guys. They have, like, Patrick Paragas from UC Santa Barbara. They also have Diego Perez, who actually did work against his former team. He actually had 11 kills, and he was a former wave. Brayden Van Groningen added 16 kills. Isaac Seltzer, 12 kills. Will Avera, 11 kills. The Mustangs hit 285 to Pepperdine's 244. And honestly, the headline for Pepperdine's recap was Pepperdine is stunned or waves stunned by Mustangs. And this was kind of a stunning defeat. I don't care what anyone says. This is an upset win. And then for Pepperdine, Cole Kachansky led the way with 23 kills. Akin Akinakin, Akin Akin Wumi led the way with 13 kills, or he had 13 kills. And Alexander Markalj, Markalj, added 12 kills but for the silver lining for pepperdine is it's better to lose now than to lose either this week or in the mpsf tournament but i just don't see how pepperdine survives in the mpsf tournament and that's pretty much that for the notable matchups so there were some other quick hits we had we had long beach state defeating csun twice which i thought was impressive they've clinched a share of the Big West Conference t- regular season title. They can get the outright conference title and the number one seed of the conference tournament if they beat UC Irvine at least once. You also had Penn State sweep- beating Charleston twice. They took down the 
in the Eagles in four sets in the first match and then straight sets in the second match. George Mason, um, Mike Pat in the chat room, he actually was wondering any news on the DMV. So regarding George Mason, they swept Pri- – no, not Princeton, uh, Harvard. They swept Harvard twice this past weekend. And believe it or not, George Mason actually still has a chance to be the number one seed in the EIVA tournament. They have to win out, though, against Penn State at Penn State, and that's going to be a tricky matchup. But I will give this for George Mason. They went undefeated in at home this season. So if if for some reason George Mason hosts the EIVA tournament, that's going to be so tough to beat in terms of facing George Mason. But it looks like Penn State might have the EIVA locked up. And that's... And then Loyola swept Lewis. I forgot to mention number 12 Loyola swept Lewis 3-0 in the battle of the Illinois teams. Love that rivalry. I think it's a very underrated rivalry right there. And that's going to do it for the week 14 recap of the NCAA men's volleyball side of things. So jumping on over to the AVCA poll. So regarding the AVCA poll, number 1, 2, and 3 are still the same. Long Beach State is 1, UCLA 2, and Grand Canyon is 3. UCLA actually got two first place votes, which is solid, but I will just say... I still think Long Beach State still has that edge just because UCLA still has some not-so-good losses. Long Beach State only has one loss, and that was to UCLA. Grand Canyon, even though they lost twice to UCLA, they're third. Now, this was kind of questionable. UC Irvine moved up to four while BYU moved down to five. Now, maybe that'll help UC Irvine, as David Niffin actually brought up a good point. Grand Canyon actually does not have any top five wins, and the reason why UC Irvine got left out of the NCAA tournament is because they had zero top five wins, or if not one top five win. That was against Long Beach State. But this time around, they UC Irvine has multiple top five wins. They even have a lot of top ten wins as well. And maybe they could pull off one against Long Beach State. I have been hearing that Long Beach State is a little banged up, but... The Beach is definitely not a team to underestimate, even when they're injured and battered and whatnot. So BYU and Stanford stayed put at 6-7. and Stanford actually beat Concordia Irvine twice. The first match, they actually had to go 5, and the fifth set was decided 15-13. to But then the second matchup, Stanford was able to beat Concordia in 4. Penn State moved up to to 8 from 9, and then Pepperdine moved down to number 9. I'm very surprised the Waves are still in the top 10, even though they lost to the Masters College, but the Masters College is the best NAIA team. I would not be surprised if they were on the verge of moving from Div- from NAIA to Division 2, and for men's volleyball case, Division 1-2. And then Ohio State State put at 10, Ball State, Loyola, USC, all state put at 11 through 13. CSUN moved up to 14. Lewis moved down to 15. George Mason, Princeton, McKendry, all state put at 16 through 18. Purdue Fort Wayne moved up a spot to 20. And then Lindenwood, the Lions moved up into the standings. They're now number 20 as UC San Diego is bumped out. Unfortunately, that is the harsh reality for the Tritons, but Lindenwood has been such a sneaky good team, and they do have some notable upsets. And if you remember last week, they took down, well, not last week, but the previous week, they took down Ohio State on their home court in four sets on their senior night, which gave them the honor of Team of the Week in my book. All right, well, that's that for the AVCA coaches poll. So now let's jump on into. The the off-the-block poll. And the the off-the-block poll was actually the same as my poll, or or as my ballot, as Long Beach State, UCLA, Grand Canyon, Hawaii, UC Irvine were 1 through 5. BYU, Penn State, Pepperdine, Ball State, and Stanford were 6 through 10. And that, believe it or not, that was actually the same ballot, my my same ballot. So, it's no April Fool's joke. (laughs) So this week, I voted for my off-the-block men's volleyball media Ballot, Long Beach State 1, UCLA 2, Grand Canyon 3, Hawaii 4, UC Irvine 5, BYU 6, Penn State 7, Ball State 8, Pepperdine 9, and Stanford 10. I'm going to keep Pepperdine in my top 10. I don't know if they're deserving of it. I don't think they should be. If anything, I'd maybe put the Masters College in there, but I'm not going to. 
I just think that Pepperdine, with that loss to the Masters College, they were up 2 nothing. And keep in mind, they were hosting. I just don't understand how you lose when you're up 2 nothing, and then you lose a heartbreaker of a third set, you lose an extra points in the fourth set, and then you unfortunately just can't find your way in the fifth set, and you wind up losing that one. But again, you have to give credit to the Masters College. I'm just going to go, we'll, 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 keep, we'll save the Masters College for later on the NAI men's volleyball portion of the show. But right now, we're going to close the book on NCAA men's volleyball week number 14. Circle back to week 15 as we'll talk a little NCAA beach volleyball as there were some notable matches on Friday and Saturday. That's where all the matches came from. Friday, we had number 10 LMU defeating number 14 FIU 3-2. Number 20, Texas A&M Corpus Christi upset FAU 3-2. Number 7, Cal took down number 18, Arizona, in the Pac-12 North Challenge 5-0. Number 4, Florida State took down number 14, FIU 4-1. Number 8, LSU took down number 17, Stetson 4-1. Number 3, USC took down number 12, Arizona State 4-1, the Pac-12 North Challenge. Number two, Stanford took down number 13, Washington, 4-1. Number one, UCLA took down number seven, Cal, 4-1. Number five, TCU outlasted number 11, Hawaii, 3-2. Number seven, Stetson upset number 15, Georgia State, 3-2. I don't think that's a true upset, but in my opinion, it's still an upset just because... Stetson isn't really the flashiest program, but they're still a sneaky good one. Those hatters can give you all a mad hatter, or can turn you all to the mad hatter. Then we had number 13, Washington, defeating number 12, Arizona State, 3-2. Big win for the Huskies right there. We had number 10, LMU, defeating number 16, FAU, 4-1. This was the big one right here. Number 3, USC, upended number 2, Stanford, 4-1. Now that was a huge win for USC. And honestly, I would not be surprised if USC moved up from 3-2 to two in the next poll, AVCA poll. And then UAB upset number 20, Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, 3-2. to two. Oh, what a, what a tough loss for the Islanders, but those Dragons are pretty good. Then Saturday, we had number 10, LMU, defeating number 14, FIU, 3-2. to two. This was the, another big upset right here. Number 15, Georgia State, took down number 10, LSU three to two. What a huge win for those pan for those Panthers. You, you got to remember, Georgia State was the team that upended and ended TCU season back a couple seasons ago, and th- and that was just so big right there. That was so huge. It was actually number eight LSU, not number ten LSU. And then in the Pac-12 North Challenge, we had number three USC taking down number seven Cal three to two. Number five TCU handled number eleven Hawaii a little bit better four to one. Number four Florida State took down number twenty Texas A&M Corpus Christi three zero. Now I'm not sure why the match was abbreviated as opposed to the other matches from the Florida State. Invitational, but it is what it is. And then number two, Stanford def- swept number eighteen, Arizona five nothing. Number one, UCLA took down number eighteen, Arizona four one. Number thirteen, Washington. This was another big win right here. Number thirteen, Washington defeated number seven, Cal three to two. And then here was another big upset, which did not have any involvement in regards to a tournament. Number nine, Long Beach State upended number six, Cal Poly three to two. I really want to go to this match, but unfortunately, or duel for that matter, but I really want to go to this duel, but sadly I had to work and oh, I'm so, I'm kicking myself for not going to this one because this one was actually played at Laguna Beach, Laguna Beach, uh, local beach uh, or Laguna State Beach, uh, but it was a big win for Long Beach State because remember the first meeting Cal Poly got the better of the beach four to one as I think that was a huge win for Long Beach State. And looking at the top 20, UCLA is the new number one, as I kind of spoiled in my recap of matches. Stanford 2, USC 3, Florida State 4, TCU 5, Cal Poly 6, Cal 7, LSU 8, Long Beach State 9, LMU 10, Hawaii 11, Arizona State 12, Washington 13, FIU 14, Georgia State 15, Florida Atlantic or FAU 16, Stetson 17, Arizona 18, Grand Canyon 19, and Texas A&M Corpus Christi 20. Calling it right now, USC moves up to number 2, UCLA stays put at 1. Stanford will probably just go down to 3 just because they don't have too many terrible losses outside of like maybe Arizona State. 
Florida State stays put at four. TCU stays put at five. Cal Poly, I imagine... This one's kind of tricky. I don't know who would be number six, just because Cal Poly losing to Long Beach State, it kind of leaves a bad taste in other people's mouths. I think you could make the debate of putting Long Beach State at six, and then moving Cal Poly down to seven, and then moving Cal down to eight, LSU down to nine, LMU stays put at ten, unless you want to put LMU at, like, maybe nine or ten, or uh, nine, no, nine. Hawaii stays put at 11. Arizona State probably stays put at... Tw- well, actually, no. Washington goes up to 12. Arizona State goes down to 13. FIU stays at 14. Georgia's... Oh, well, no. Georgia State moves up to... I don't know. Maybe Georgia State moves up to 14, maybe 13, and then Arizona State goes down to 14. But Arizona State still has that win over Stanford. you got to remember that. Anyway, I think FIU goes down to 14. FAU... That's so tough to tell, but I think maybe Stetson goes to 16, Florida Atlantic 17, Arizona 18, GCU, maybe they go down to 20, and then Texas A&M Corpus Christi goes to goes to 19. So that's just my projection of the AVCA National Collegiate Beach Volleyball rankings. Remember, these get released every Tuesday, along with the off-the-block media poll. So you have that right there. So looking at this week's notable NCAA Beach Volleyball matches, Tuesday we have Long Beach State versus UCLA at UCLA. Um, I'm just going to be honest. Long Beach State is a very good team, but UCLA is like light years better. There's no better way of saying that. And this is no knock on the beach. Obviously that win over Cal Poly is great, but this is such a big week for Long Beach State, which I'll get into a little bit later. So Friday, we also have Arizona-Stanford. That's a nice little matchup right there, but I honestly think Stanford's going to win that one. Saturday, we have Georgia State and Washington. Let's see which team that pulled off the notable upset gets to pull off this matchup. Then we have Grand Canyon-Hawaii at Hawaii. Then Sunday, we have FIU-Stetson and FIU versus FAU. And then Grand Canyon and Hawaii take on one another in Grand, at, in Hawaii for, Grand, for Hawaii's senior night. Or senior day. Senior night. Because it's being played at 6.30 p.m. Hawaii time. All right, well, that's that for those matchups. But there, but what's really taking center stage, no pun intended, is the Center of Effort Challenge at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So here's the schedule. Friday, we have, we have number three USC. It looks like that partially got, defeat, got deleted. As USC kicks off the... The watch the uh, center of effort challenge, and then after that, it's number one UCLA taking on LMU. Ah, uh, that's that's kind of sucky right there, just because my I was printing out the schedule and it looks like part of it got deleted. So USC and Pepperdine face one another. So USC and Pepperdine face one another at 10 a.m. and then you have UCLA and LMU facing one another after that. And then after that, it's Long Beach State, TCU. Then Cal Poly, the host team, takes on number four, Florida State. Then USC and Long Beach State square off. UCLA and Florida State square off after that matchup. And then Pepperdine, TCU after that matchup. And then Cal Poly closes off the center of effort challenge day one against LMU. Then day two, we have USC taking on TCU. Cal Poly taking on, taking on UCLA after that. Pepperdine taking on Long Beach State, and then LMU taking on Florida State to close off pool play in the center of effort challenge. And then the seventh place match will be at seven at two p.m. Fifth place matchup will be at three fifteen. Third place matchup four thirty, and then the first place matchup will be at five forty five. So it's basically eight teams squaring off against in, in like a round robin pool play matchup, and then whoever has the best record of of the teams will advance to the first place and then second, third, and then the third place match and then the fifth place match and the seventh place match. You get the point. So this is going to be a fun week. And the center of effort challenge is, uh, is basically going to separate the contenders from the pretenders. Though I think in terms of like NCAA beach volleyball, I think it's wide open, but all in all for, the center of effort challenge. You have a lot. I think you have three, seven out of eight ranked teams. The only unranked team, sadly, is Pepperdine. And I think every, yeah, every team is in the top ten. You have, and I think you have almost every team 
in the top five. Unfortunately, don't have Stanford in this. Thanks a lot, Stanford. You just had to ruin it for us. I'm just kidding. All right, but that is that for the NCAA Beach Volleyball side of things. If you're in the Cal Poly San Luis Obispo era, er, area, definitely do check out that. But let's move on to some NAI men's volleyball. All right, so we obviously talked a little about the Masters College win over Pepperdine. I really think the Masters College is probably the team to beat. Them and Vanguard are on a collision course to face one another in the NAIA championship. And the Masters College, the best thing about them is is that they had no shortage of a hangover as they actually took down Menlo, number six in the NAIA coaches poll, in four sets. Now, the Masters College eventually moved up to number one, Vanguard down to two, and then Menlo stayed put at number six. But for the Mustangs, they won the match 25-22, 24-26, 27-25, and 25-20. That third set is what really turned the tide for the Masters College, and that was kind of the turning point, as the Mustangs were led by three different players with 13 kills, Diego Perez, Will Avera, and Isaac Seltzer. Mason Mullins added nine kills. The Mustangs hit 364 compared to Menlo's 259. It was a block party at the Masters College or the Masters University as the Mustangs had eight blocks compared to Menlo's three. Even though the Mustangs missed 27 serves and they had got out dug by four, the Mustangs just looked like such a solid team. Julius Steimer led the, led the Oaks with 16 kills. Wojcezek Nowak added 10 kills. Conrad Stuck. Stoklosinski added nine kills for Menlo, as Makana Melkor added 15 digs for the Oaks. But unfortunately, it was it was just not enough as Menlo closes out the regular season against Vanguard. Speaking of the Lions, oh man, what a tough week to be a Vanguard fan. Well, the first match for Vanguard, they won on Friday against Arizona Christian, which was kind of obvious. But against Ottawa of Arizona, well. Let's just say that without a low ceiling, I don't think Vanguard was going to win this one. But Ottawa was able to take down Vanguard on its senior night or senior day in four sets, 27-25, 27-25, 19-25, and 25-22. Ottawa was led by Adon Nestor, who had 24 kills. Emery Outen added 12 kills. Caden Salmon added 9 kills. As Ottawa hit 345, even though Vanguard hit 445, Ottawa of Arizona was able to pull out the win. And that's such a massive win for Ottawa. They didn't really have too much, too many big time wins. <laughs> As Marcus Lowscrape popped into the chat room, he said salute. And he said Arizona Christian is trash, lol. Oh, God. I mean, I mean, unfortunately, you're not wrong. And sadly, that is the truth in terms of their in terms of their record. And it's just a tough time to be a ACU fan. But it is what it is. But Ottawa of Arizona pulling off that win, that just goes to show that the Spirit is definitely a team to watch for in the NAIA. Vanguard was led by Will Anderson, who had 18 kills. He hit 531. Andrew Shevlin added 12 kills with a hitting percentage of 409. I actually did make a mistake on Twitter and on uh, Instagram. I said that the Masters College has clinched a share of the Golden State Athletic Conference style. That is actually not true. The Masters College still has to win out this week. So if the Masters College somehow loses out and then Vanguard wins their final matchup against Menlo, then Vanguard will be the Golden State Athletic Conference champion and they'll be the number one seed. But as Marcus Lowscrape pointed out, Arizona Christian is just not good. I mean, the Masters call. I mean, this isn't a knock on ACU, but the Masters College is just on a whole other level. They're taking down NCAA Division 1-2 teams. You can't tell me with a straight face that Arizona Christian is going to find a way to upset the Masters College. It's just not going to happen. And then this upcoming weekend, uh, the Masters College also hosts Ottawa of Arizona. Now that could be a good momentum builder for Ottawa or the Masters College, but... I mean, it's going to be in Santa Clara, so Ottawa has to go from 
surprise Arizona all the way down to Northern California or or uh, Santa Clara. I want to give Arizona, not Arizona Christian, uh, Ottawa of Arizona a shot at winning. Maybe they'll have they have a shot at beating the Masters College for Vanguard's sake. If they want at least a share of the the conference title of the GSAP conference title, they're going to need Ottawa to win. And then, like I said, Vanguard hosts Menlo on Friday, which I might go to, but with Vanguard pretty much being out of the conference title picture, I don't know. And Long Beach State UC Irvine is so tempting to go to, but we'll see. But yeah, I pretty much see the Masters College clinching the Golden State Athletic Conference title. I'll try to talk a little bit more outside of just the Masters College or any of the G-Set or Vanguard, but those teams are number one and number two, and Ottawa is cre- has crept up to number three. So you could say that the Golden State Athletic Conference is the premier conference in the NAIA regarding men's volleyball. And I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Huh? But again, no knock on the other teams in the NAIA. All right, but that's that for some NAIA men's volleyball talk. So jumping on over to the 3C2A, there wasn't anything too exciting. Regard There wasn't too many notable upsets in, in regards to the 3C2A men's side of things as, honestly, it was a fairly quiet week. But Orange Coast College, who is still undefeated, they clinched a share of the Orange Empire Conference title as they swept Santiago Canyon. This week is a huge week for Orange Coast as they host Golden West this Friday. And they also head down to Irvine to take on Irvine Valley on Friday. So in terms of the updated 3C2A men's volleyball rankings, OCC is still number one. Golden West moved up to number two. San Diego Mesa, if you remember, they lost to San Diego Miramar in five. They moved down to three. Irvine Valley moved down to four. Long Beach City Long Beach City. Still stayed put at 5. Moore Park and Santa Monica are both tied at 6. San Diego Miramar is 8. Santa Barbara City is 9. And then Grossmont is 10. What a what a heartbreaking and gut-wrenching time to be a San Diego Miramar fan. Just because San Diego Miramar is, is going to be left out of the conference. Uh, it's it's going to be left out of the NA or the 3C2A men's volleyball playoffs. Just because... In terms, remember, you got to look at the automatic qualifiers. One automatic qualifier from the Pacific Coast Conference, one automatic qualifier for the Orange Empire Conference, and four automatic qualifiers from the Western State at the Western State Conference. That means if if the standings still hold, OCC is going to be the one the uh, automatic qualifier from the Orange Empire Conference, and then from the Pacific Coast Conference, that's going to be San Diego Mesa, and then the conference champion will be Long Beach City from the Western State Conference, and then the other automatic qualifiers will be Moore Park, Santa Monica, and Santa Barbara City. So Santa Barbara is going to get into the playoffs over San Diego Miramar, and if you're a San Diego Miramar fan, you got to be sick to your stomach seeing that you're ranked ahead of a team, and you're going to be left out of the big dance. And then you're wondering who the at-larges are going to be. That's going to be Golden West and Irvine Valley. I would be very surprised if neither of those teams made the tournament. It's got to be Golden West and Irvine Valley. Those teams have been in the top ten throughout most of the season. If not the top three, let alone the top five. So, honestly, Golden West and Irvine Valley are going to be your top you're at larges in the event Orange Coast does clinch the Orange Empire Conference automatic qualifier. But looking, but let's take a dive on in to the schedule for this week. So Wednesday we have Golden West at Irvine or Orange Coast. That's going to be a huge matchup. San Diego Mesa takes on San Diego Miramar. All right, if the Jets want to have any sort of chance of making the playoffs and being the Pacific Coast Conference champion. They kind of got to win out as it looks like they only have one more match on the docket as, yeah, that's their last matchup. So they have to hope that they win that matchup. And then for San Diego Mesa, they have to hope that they, San Diego Mesa, oh no, they're, they're, they're done for the rest of the season too. Well, that's weird. Interesting. But it says here that San Diego Mesa, I don't know. 
Maybe San Diego. Maybe the three C two three C two A has got to update its re- records regarding some of these teams. But um, if you all remember correctly, San Diego Mesa and San Diego Miramar split the first two matches, as Miramar wound up losing the first matchup in in straight sets, and then at home, they were able to take down San Diego Mesa in five sets. So with this matchup, it's going to be held at San Diego Miramar, and the winner of this matchup goes to the playoffs. But then again, this is kind of where a bid sealer could come into play. So if San Diego Miramar and San Diego Mesa tie, which means that San Diego Miramar would have to beat San Diego Mesa, Miramar would be, based on head-to-head matches, Miramar would be the automatic qualifier from the Pacific Coast Conference, and they'd get in, while San Diego Mesa would have to be an at-large, meaning that could cause a lot of confusion with Irvine Valley and Golden West. That would be, wouldn't that be something to see San Diego Miramar being a bid stealer, and then San Diego Mesa, Irvine Valley, and Golden West, basically, one of them are going to be on the outside looking in. It's kind of like, Grand Canyon, UC Irvine, and Hawaii in the NCAA men's volleyball side of things. So that San Diego Mesa, San Diego Miramar matchup actually has a lot more implications than normal. All right, but that, that, that was that for that little matchup right there. And then you also have Moore Park versus Santa Barbara City. And that's pretty much that for... Uh, Wednesday's matchups. Now, Friday's matchups, obviously Orange Coast, Irvine Valley are the, the, is the headliner for that mat, for that day. And that's pretty much that, because every other matchup isn't really a headliner match. I mean, Santa Monica, El Camino is the only thing that comes close to it, but it is what it is. All right, but that is that for the 3C2A in terms of men's volleyball. Now let's discuss a little high school boys volleyball, and then we'll take a quick little commercial break. So... In terms of last week, the notable matchup, obviously, well, most t- most schools are on spring break, but Newport Harbor, Corona Del Mar was not on spring break. I don't know why, but don't look at me. I don't. I'm not a part of the school district. But um, Battle of the Bay was definitely rather something, and Corona Del Mar, a team that had not beaten Newport Harbor in league, finally broke through, and they managed to beat the Sailors in straight sets on the road. And the craziest thing is that it was their head coach's birthday, Katie Thompson, who was a former set point guest, and her birthday wish was she wanted to beat Newport Harbor in Battle of the Bay. And keep in mind, Katie Thompson is a former Newport Harbor sailor or a Newport Harbor alum. She got her birthday wish, which was straight up phenomenal, as Sterling Foley led the Sea Kings with 21 kills. And then he was kind of the catalyst. And Sterling Foley does Sterling Foley things. USC is going to be so fortunate to have that player on the, on the team. And honestly, he's just a straight-up phenomenal player. I want to say he had over half the kills that CDM have. If this is not official. This was kind of kind of by my numbers. As Yeah, by my count, he had over half of Corona Del Mar's kills. Now, again, that's unofficial, but... It could possibly be true. Whereas Newport Harbor, they were led by Riggs Guy, who had 15 kills. Jack Berry had 8 kills. But the key to, to New- Corona Del Mar's win was that they shut down Newport Harbor's medals. They took away Newport Harbor's medals. They actually, Newport Harbor actually had 19 kills in the middle from the previous matchup. In this meeting, they only had 12 that is a massive step back from the previous meeting. And you have to give it up to Corona Del Mar. They had a great game plan. And the Sea Kings also served efficiently. They only had missed five serves, where Newport Harbor, they missed 13. And their serving didn't really come alive until the third set, where they actually got three aces. So I'm just going to say, this was such a big win for Corona Del Mar. If they don't get this win... They're probably not going to be the two seed. They'd probably be at best the three seed, which would mean they'd have to go on the road to Newport Harbor to win that one. But now Corona Del Mar is probably going to be the two seed. I think they're the two seed. Loyola of Los Angeles is the one seed. Newport Harbor is the three seed. uh, Miracosta is the four seed. Huntington Beach is the five seed. Six seed would probably be Edison, 
which they play Huntington Beach tomorrow. Seven would be Modern Day, who probably has the Trinity League on lock. And then the eighth seed, you can make the debate for like Tesoro, maybe Redondo Union, maybe Servite. I mean, you still have that great weekend that Tesoro had in Best of the West. But that 8th seed, whoever gets the 8th seed is going to have the worst possible path to the championship. Because they're basically going to have to go on the road to take on Loyola. And that's such a tough matchup with the likes of Sean Kelly leading the way. Speaking of Loyola of Los Angeles, they actually won the Brophy Prep Tournament up in Arizona. They even beat Sandra Day O'Connor twice in the knockout round. So I guess this tournament was double elimination and it was a little funky, but Loyola was able to win that tournament. And this just goes to show the depth of those cubbies. And Michael Bully does a great job with this program. So I will just say, I would not be surprised if Loyola of Los Angeles wound up winning the CIF Southern section title. I mean, beating Sandra Day O'Connor is no laughing matter. I think beating that team twice in a row is definitely a feather in your cap. And there's a reason why Loyola is one of the best teams, if not the best team in the nation when it comes to high school boys volleyball. And for those that are going to use Loyola's loss to modern day in the Best of the West Tournament, you got to remember, Loyola does not peak in the Best of the West Tournament. They peak when it truly matters in the big-time matchups against Corona Del Mar, Newport Harbor, even though they're not on the schedule, Miracosta, and then their league, they just blow everybody away in league, which is why they got to schedule tougher tournaments, such as the Brophy Prep, the Brophy College Prep tournament and whatnot. So, yeah, Loyola of Los Angeles, they're a powerhouse, and there's a reason why they're the consensus number one. But as for notable high school boys volleyball matches this week, I think it's got to be Edison. Edison Huntington Beach is tomorrow at Edison. Now, the Chargers can possibly move up, but they're number six. If not, they'll probably be seven. I mean, you look at Edison's body of work. They have a win over Modern Day. I just don't see Edison moving up. The only way Edison moves up is if they win out and Huntington Beach loses out. But that would mean that Edison would have to beat Corona Del Mar and Newport Harbor next week. And then Huntington Beach... It, they still have a chance to win their league and move up in the stand in the uh, rankings of the CIF Southern Section rankings, but I just don't see them any higher than number three, just because they have the loss to Miracosta, and unfortunately for them, they don't have too many big time wins. But maybe Huntington Beach can jump Newport Harbor and Corona Del Mar, but that would require Corona Del Mar losing out and then Newport Harbor also losing out. So. Huntington Beach would need to get extremely lucky in terms of winning the remainder of its matches and then getting a lot of help from Edison the rest of the way. But um, that's pretty much that for some of the notable high school boys volleyball matchups. I know the Surf League is... I, I just mentioned Surf League matches, but that's probably the most unpredictable league and probably the best league in the nation just because those four teams that I mentioned, Edison, Huntington Beach, Newport Harbor, Corona Del Mar, they're in the top eight of their division in the CIF Southern section. So it's food for thought right there. But that's going to do it for the high school boys volleyball portion of the show. Next week is actually the last week of the regular season. This week is the second to last week of the regular season. We'll take ourselves a quick break. When we come back, we've got some Pro Volleyball Federation to discuss. And then we have to preview week 15 of the NCAA men's volleyball season. And I will give you all my prediction of the MIVA tournament and how it's going to play out. So keep it locked here. You are listening to Set Point here on IA Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. Hello, sports fans. It's me, your boy, Larry B., and I want to walk you through the world of sports. No, no, no. Not just the mainstream major TV deal type sports, although those are important too. But let me be your guide to your journey of all sports, from college to the pros, the minors, and everything in between. Each week, we are talking sports galore with true diehards just like you from a hardcore fan's perspective that's sure to quench your thirst around leagues you may know all too well and some you may even discover here. That's right, sports fans. 
If you love sports of all kinds, enjoy hearing amazing sports stories and respect all sports because you know how difficult any of them can be to play or compete in, then this is your show. Join me, your boy Larry B, on the defining moment each week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports, and let the sports come to you. Hello, ladies and sinners. Hello, sports fans around the world. Hello, IE Sports family. This is Kale Henderson, the host of IE Vegas, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio. If you folks are interested in sports in the Vegas area, if you're wanting to have a blast for one hour every Tuesday night from 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, this is a show built for the Vegas sports fan, where we feature the Las Vegas Raiders, the Las Vegas Golden Knights, the Las Vegas Aces, and the University of Las Vegas, Nevada Rebels. Hopefully, fingers crossed, MLB team coming soon. Either way, if you folks are looking to have a blast for one hour each and every week, tune in Tuesday, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you folks are interested in Vegas sports news, Go to our Twitter, at SinCities underscore I-E-S-R, and you can speak with me, the host, Kale Henderson, at Kale underscore Henderson on Twitter. At any time, be happy to reply. Always want to reach out to our fans. Again, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Chi-Town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks. Cubs, White Sox, we'll cover them all, plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi-Town Weekly, every week, right here, IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Back with segment number two of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. Definitely check out all of our amazing shows as we have a lot going on. We even added a new Seattle show, which I think is awesome sauce. But let's get on into the second half of Set Point as let's discuss a little Pro Volleyball Federation. So as of as we are doing this show live. Unfortunately, I hate to tell you all this, but uh, there's a match going on. <laughs> oh, it's between the Atlanta Vibe and the Vegas Thrill. This always happens, and why can't the Pro Volleyball Federation legit just not be on a Monday? Please, 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 as Marcus Lowe would say, but. As for the Pro Volleyball Federation, 
last Tuesday was basically what started week 11, and this, it started off with a bang as, believe it or not, the San Diego Mojo, oh man, they pulled off probably the biggest upset we've probably seen the Pro Volleyball Federation. They defeated the Omaha Supernovas 20-25, 25-21, 25-23, and 25-22 at Viejas Arena. If anyone had the San Diego Mojo pulling off the upset against the Omaha Supernovas, one of the best teams in the league, if not maybe the favorite to win it all because they're hosting the whole tournament or the whole Final Four and National Championship, please stand up. Because I certainly did. didn't. The Mojo were led by Temi Thomas Ilar, who had 22 kills and 17 digs. Kendra Dalkey had 17 kills and 11 digs. Valeria Papa had 13 kills and 15 digs. Nutsara Tomcom, 51 assists and 20 digs. Maria Shara Venegas had 23 digs and 9 assists. The Mojo had 101 digs as a team. 101 digs in a four-set match. That is pretty impressive. Meanwhile, the Supernovas were led by Betty De La Cruz, who had 26 kills and 13 digs. But she was kind of the only one leading the way for Omaha. She actually had half of Omaha's overall kills, and no other player had no more than six. Which, oh, that's that's pretty saddening, if you ask me. But it is what it is. Paige Briggs had 14 digs to go along with six kills. Sydney Hilly had 39 assists to go along with 12 digs. And Kendall White had 12 digs. Honestly, in my opinion, this is a massive upset. But if you're the Omaha Supernovas, this loss doesn't mean too, too much. Just because the next matchup that I'm about to discuss, they look pretty fine to me. Patty Back says, Taryn, do you think the geography is a factor in volleyball? For example, do you think players are better in the West Coast versus the East? I know it's a generality, but I was just curious. Thanks. That's a good question, and... You know, this was actually the first time the Omaha Supernovas played in San Diego. So maybe that had a factor. But honestly, the Supernovas are just such a strong and dominant team. Like last week, they had such a great week. And then this week, they put up this little stinker of a matchup. But maybe the Mojo just had nothing to lose. And the Supernovas just had all the pressure in the world because they want to keep up with the Atlanta vibe. And this loss does them no favors. Now, fortunately, Thursday, the Supernovas came back to the CHI Health Center, and they wound up beating the Columbus Fury 25-20, 25-22, 21-25, and 25-22. Betty De La Cruz led the way with 26 kills. She had 6.30, and she had 13 digs. Nia Reed had 16 kills and 9 digs. Brooke Nunaviller had 14 kills and 16 digs. Now, Omaha had a new setter, Natalia Valentin Anderson, who had 57 assists. Now, I don't know what happened with Sydney Hilly, but honestly, ugh, that's kind of tough for her. But Valentin Anderson led the, led the offense quite well. Meanwhile, for Columbus, Megan Courtney Lush had 17 kills and 13 digs. Cooper also, Regan Cooper also chipped in 17 kills. Asia O'Neill had 11 kills and 2 blocks. And Ray Morali Santos had 35 assists and 9 digs. Now, the Supernovas needed to win this one in the worst way. If they had lost two in a row, that would have been so detrimental because those two losses would have been extremely bad losses, if you ask me. And unfortunately, Gen B, yes, the Fury is falling apart. But honestly, the Supernovas really need to win that one. Imagine losing two in a row to probably two of the not-so-better teams. And one of them being at home. Because you have to remember, I think this was the second meeting between the Supernovas and the Fury. Because if you remember the first meeting, the Fury wound up beating the Supernovas on in uh, Columbus in four sets. Which was so big right there. And Megan Courtney Lush, from what I heard, she said she hated playing in Nebraska. But she has a record of like three and four playing in Lincoln against the Huskers. And then... In Omaha, I think she has a 1-3 record from what I saw. 
And again, this is speculation. This was from at Avid Volley, but I guess there was like a soundbite that heard Megan Courtney Lush saying, I hate playing in Nebraska. Oh, poor Megan Courtney Lush. I mean, you have to remember, she was a Penn State Nittany line, and she had to play some of her matches against Nebraska, and their fans show up and show out. Because remember, volleyball in Nebraska is much more different than volleyball any place. By the way, I will just say, I legit could not watch the stream for the love of me. The stream was just so choppy, and this is no knock on the Pro Volleyball Federation but it was just skipping so terribly. I'm sorry, but it was just so... Ugh. If you saw live, you would have totally agreed. And I even posted and said, what is going on with this live stream? Why, why is this skipping and just jumping all over the place? Because it eventually would pause and then speed up and then pause and then speed up. That was my biggest qualm when it came to watching that stream. I'm sorry, but it was just a big qualm. And I know the Pro Volleyball Federation is going to iron it out, but... <laughs> anyway, jumping to Saturday... And yes, Gen B, it was completely awful. So, Saturday, history was made in Pro Volleyball Federation as... This matchup actually was shown on CBS Sports as the Orlando Valkyries took on the Grand Rapids Rise in Van Andel Arena, where the Valkyries wound up beating the Rise 25-18, 21-25, 25-21, 19-25, and 15-19. It was a big win for those Valkyries as, honestly, it it was... They needed this win just because, remember, the four spot is probably what's up for grabs, but maybe the three spot could be too. Marcus, Marcus Loscrete was, was, says someone was using the McDonald's Wi-Fi. LOL. I imagine me. I, now I'm guessing he's thinking of that regarding, regarding the uh, CHI health center or maybe the connection, but maybe he's thinking that in terms of like broadcasting of how they broadcast that game. But yeah, I will. Just, yeah. Someone must have used McDonald's Wi-Fi says, better put some foil on that router antenna. Oh, God. Marcus. Marcus is just all over the place with this. <laughs> anyway, so for the Valkyries, they were led by Adora Ane, who had 16 kills, 12 digs, and 3 blocks. Kaz Brown had 13 kills. She hit 590, and she had 4 blocks. Shania Joseph had 9 kills and 13 digs. Wilma Rivera had 35 assists and 8 digs. George Murphy chipped in 13 digs. The Rise were led by Claire Chausse, who had 23 kills and 22 digs. Shannon Scully had 15 kills and 14 digs. Amelia Dimitrova had 13 kills and 12 digs. Ashley Evans had 52 assists and 15 digs. And Sarah Sponsel had 15 digs. And that's the crazy thing. The Grand Rapids Rise had 80-some kills, while Orlando had, like, somewhere in the mid-60s. And yet, Grand Rapids Rise lost that one. So... I will just say at least the Grand Rapids Rise didn't lose in overtime when it came to some of their sets. But losing sets in general, yeah. And like I mentioned, this was the first ever broadcasted match on CBS Sports. And what a way to perform. Going five with Paul Sunderland and Holly McPeak on the broadcast. That is a plus right there. And then on Sunday, we had the San Diego Mojo defeating the Columbus Fury at Viejas Arena. 23-25, 25-19, 25-22, and 25-23. Now, the fourth set, it looked like the Fury was going to come back. They were down 24-21. They scored two straight. But Temi Thomas Ilara was her. She had 27 kills. She had 12 digs. And she had the final kill, which gave the Mojo their second straight win. And it was such a huge win for the Mojo because now they're no longer in last place. So, Temi thomas Lara, like I said, she had 27 kills, 12 digs. Valeria Papa had 11 kills and 13 digs. Kendra Dalki, 10 kills. Nutsara Tomcom, 49 assists and 15 digs. Maria Shara Venegas had 13 digs. The Fury were led by Co- Regan Cooper, who had 18 kills and 12 digs. Sam Drexel had 15 kills and 11 digs. Megan Courtney Lush, 14 kills and 15 digs. Ray Morali Santos, 33 assists and 6 digs. And Ivana de Jesus Ortiz was the libero for the Columbus Fury, and she had 10 digs. So I don't know what happened with with the previous libero, but 
That's kind of rough if having a new libero, but it is what it is. So it's good to see the Mojo are showing some fight, but how far can they keep this up? And how long can they keep this up? I feel they have some momentum, and maybe, maybe they will possibly, they could possibly keep this up. I mean, as Patty Back said in the chat room, maybe West Coast teams play better on the West Coast as opposed to playing on the East Coast. But, but it's just food for thought right there. Meanwhile, for the Fury, I hope it's not the case of them falling apart. I'd hate to see them fall apart at the seams right this minute, but honestly, they need a, they need some sort of answer. They really need to find someone to answer the bell ASAP. And then looking at the standings right now, the Atlanta Vibe are 12 and 4. The Omaha Supernovas are a match back. So the Supernovas aren't too far back of the Vibe, but it, the loss to San Diego did not do them any favors. Uh, because they could have probably been tied with the Vibe had they just played their cards right. The Orlando Valkyries are now in third place, while the Grand Rapids Rise are in, are in fourth place. The San Diego Mojo are in fifth place. The Columbus Fury are in sixth place. And then the Vegas Thrill are, in, are dead last at five and ten. Every The Mojo, the Fury, and the Thrill all have five wins, or each have five wins. And then, uh, oh, Val... Leon, Valeria Leon did not play on Sunday, so or she didn't play much on Sunday. So, oh, that that's a good point. Oh, that that explains it why. That explains why. So, thank you, Jen B, for pointing that out in the live chat room. So, yeah, Leon did not play on Sunday, so that makes a massive difference for the Fury. I mean, they need to get everyone healthy. I mean, they have Asia O'Neill back in the lineup, their number one overall pick. They also got to get. They also got to get. They're getting Reagan Cooper involved. Megan Courtney Lush has been a nice little asset for the Fury, but they just got to get everything together. They got to get all their pieces together because now it gets really interesting because the Rise are, the Rise aren't too far ahead. They're actually only, I think they're only one game ahead of the Columbus Fury because they're six and eight. The Fury are five and nine. The Mojo have not played the same number of matches as everyone as they've actually played only 12 matches. So the Mojo still have to basically keep it. They basically have a lot of catching up to do in terms of matches played. But um, to close out the final week of the regular or of week number 11, the uh, Atlanta Vibe and the Vegas Thrill are playing one another, and I'm just so furious that they're they are uh, playing right now. Also, I will just say the uh, the Thrill also waived setter Hannah Maddox, so tough times for Hannah Maddox. But hopefully, she lands on a team. It just, it's just how it is sometimes. But that's gonna do it for the Pro Volleyball Federation in Week 11. Now, jumping over to Week 12, I know there's still a match going on, but looking at Week 12. Wednesday, we have the Atlanta the Atlanta Vibe taking on the San Diego Mo- Mojo in Vieja Serena. All right, so this could rather be an interesting match. I still think the Vibe are probably going to win, but the Mojo they're playing they've won they're playing so much better. They've won two in a row, and Tammy Thomas Ilara is just straight up a beast. I would not be surprised if she was named Player of the Week in Week Eleven, but Week Twelve. I would have to go with the vibe on this one, but don't be surprised if the Mojo make the Atlanta vibe sweat this one out. This is going to be on Wednesday, and I wish I'd not have plans on Wednesday, but it is what it is. Then Thursday, we have the Grand Rapids Rise heading down to heading down to Orlando to take on the Orlando Valkyries at Edition Financial Arena. Well, the Rise and the Valkyries aren't too far separated from one another in the three and four spot, so... If the Valkyries can continue to their stellar gameplay, they might have a chance. But the Rise are not going to take this one sitting down. I really think that the Grand Rapids Rise still have a solid team. It's just all about putting everybody together and having everyone do their part. And we'll see if the Valkyries can get another win over the Rise. But that, but definitely consider the Rise having that revenge factor regarding how they just lost and that that was obviously a tough one right there, but it is what it is, and they're just going to have to hit the ground running in terms of possibly getting getting back on the winning track and still managing to keep themselves in the hunt. 
And then on Friday, this one's going to be on CBS Sports Network. This is the San Diego Mojo heading down to Columbus to take on the Columbus Fury in Nationwide Arena. All right, so this is going to be a fun matchup. I want to see if the Mojo can win on the road. But for the Fury, they really need this one in the worst way. They really have to win this one. If they don't, then things are going to fall further apart for the Fury. But for the Mojo, like I said, they're playing some great volleyball, and they just have to keep it going. And then Saturday, there's a doubleheader on YouTube. Vegas Thrill takes on the Grand Rapids Rise. Well, for the Thrill, here's my thing. The Thrill have to get their winning ways back. And without Hannah Maddox, they're now going to have to bank on a new setter, and they need to get Molly McCage back healthy as possible. If they do, they might have a shot. But honestly, for the Rise, this is kind of a... This could be a, a match where they could either find their momentum and find their their like mental back into their positivity in the right direction, or they could fall further back and they could find themselves in the in the uh, mixture of the five teams of the three and four spot. And then we also have the Omaha Supernovas taking on the Atlanta Vibe at Gas South Arena in Atlanta, Georgia. I hate how both these matchups are... I hate how this matchup is at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, as well as the Vegas Thrill Grand Rapids Rise match. All right, but Omaha Supernovas, Atlanta Vibe, this is huge for both teams. The Vibe lead the Supernovas by one match. I will just say... Don't be surprised if the Supernovas do manage to take down the Vibe. But I will also just say that the Vibe are playing some good volleyball. I think the Supernovas really need to keep their consistency going. And then closing off Week 12, we have the San Diego Mojo heading down to additional addition Financial Arena to take on the Orlando Valkyries. All right. Again, the Mojo are playing great volleyball, but this is such a huge week. They have three matches in one week, they take on the Vibe, they take on the Fury, they take on the Valkyries. Here's my thing. The Mojo have to get Temi thomas Ilara going and get get her all the help she needs. Because she can't will that team by herself. As for the Valkyries, they need everyone stepping up. Especially... Especially, especially Jill Gillen. I know she's like 5'7", but honestly... I definitely think she can def I definitely think that she'll be able to step up. And I know they have one player out for the season, which does suck. I forget her name. It's like but it's but it, it is what it is at this point. And honestly I don't know her name, but I, I also should mention now that I'm mentioning the Falcons, they actually just signed Skylar Field, so she is a baller. She definitely can do damage for the Orlando Valkyries. And honestly, that's going to be so big for them. So getting Skylar Fields involved will be so big for the Orlando Valkyries. Because if they get her involved, she is going to do big things for the Valkyries. And it's going to help them out offensively even more. But we'll see what happens as honestly... Time will tell. I think that we have the whole any given week at this point. So it's going to be fun this week. And we're, the season is winding down. And soon we're going to be seeing the teams battle it out in in Omaha, Nebraska at the CHI Health Center for the first annual NV, or Pro Volleyball Federation Championship. All right, but that is that for the Real Pro Volleyball or the Pro Volleyball Federation discussion of this show. All right, so let's jump on into some NCAA men's volleyball week 15. It's the last week before conference tournaments begin all over. So this week, the MIVA takes center stage. So I'm just going to skim through some of these matchups. So Thursday and Friday, we have Pepperdine heading down to Arizona to take on number three Grand Canyon. All right, this is going to be a fun matchup. I know Grand Canyon can't win the MPSF without help from Concordia Irvine, but if they can win both of these matchups against Pepperdine, that could go a long way just because that could help them out in terms of them getting an at-large in case they need to be an at-large. And then I'm going to throw this matchup at you all. This isn't a ranked-on-ranked -ranked matchup, but this matchup is so crucial. Edward Waters heading down to Jacksonville, Florida to take on Fort Valley State. First place is on the line between Edward Waters and Fort Valley State. If Edward Waters wins, then they're pretty much the number one seed in the SIAC tournament. 
But if Fort Valley State wins, then it's based, the pressure is on Edward Waters to win their last match. And same can be said for Fort Valley State. But honestly, Fort Valley State is hosting, and this is going to be such a crucial matchup. And then Friday and Saturday, we have USC at number number 13, USC at number 7, Stanford. Again, this is just to improve seeding. This is a matchup that's just going to improve the seeding for USC and Stanford because Stanford could honestly fall to that sixth seed. And honestly, USC could jump. They could jump to the sixth seed. I think Pepperdine is ahead of USC by two matches. And even if USC and Pepperdine tie with one another... Pepperdine has the head-to-head matches, and honestly, that's the that's the difference right there. And that could that could possibly put USC and Pepperdine in the four-five spot. But honestly, that wouldn't that wouldn't be too too terrible. I mean, they'd have to play UCLA in the semifinals if they were to eventually get to that point. But maybe the sixth seed would be better for USC, just because. They would be. They would play BYU, who they have an answer for. I still think Pe- USC squares off better against Pepperdine, in my opinion. But that is that for that little matchup right there. And then we have on Friday and Saturday, number seventeen George Mason heading down to Rec Hall to take on number eight Penn State. All right. I don't really have much to say about this matchup. I imagine Penn State is going to win at least one match between the two. Because if Penn State wins, they host the EIVA tournament. They're outright EIVA conference regular season champions, and they get the one seed. If George Mason wins both matchups against Penn State, then they're the one seed of the EIVA tournament. They clinch a share of the EIVA regular season title, and also they would be they would be hosting the EIVA tournament, which George Mason has not lost at this season. They have not lost at home this season. So there's that matchup right there, but I imagine Penn State will come down, come out on top. And then we have my match in series of the week. Number one, Long Beach State, and number four, UC Irvine. The two teams play each other on Friday at the Brent Event Center and on Saturday at the Walter Pyramid. The only way UC Irvine can win, can get a share of the conference title in the regular season and get the number one seed is if they beat Long Beach State twice. Now, that would mean that Halir Henna would have to go off. Nolan Flexen would also have to go off. And Will Darcy and Max Gregoriev and Connor Campbell would all have to go off. And UC Irvine would have to play like they did against Long Beach State in the Big West Conference Tournament. But I will say, Long Beach State is such a machine. Like, you don't beat them just out of the blue. You have to actually outplay them in every aspect of the game of volleyball. But beating Long Beach State at least once at least once could go a long way for being an at large, especially if they get to the semifinals or they get to the finals of the conference of the Big West Conference tournament. Because remember, David Niffen said this best of volleyball magazine. The Grand Canyon has zero top five wins. At the very least, uh, UC Irvine has three. Maybe they could get four, but time will tell. All right, but oh well, they actually have four. They beat Grand Canyon, they beat Stanford twice, and they beat Hawaii. I'm sorry, I I, I I'm struggling with math and English. All right, but that is that for the matchups to watch for for this week. All right, now for the MIVA tournament. So the MIVA tournament goes as follows: the one seed is Ball State. They're hosting. So the quarterfinals are the highest are the uh, top four seeds host, and then the the last remaining top seed or the highest remaining seed will host the semifinals and finals. So Ball State is the one seed. Loyola Chicago is the two seed. Ohio State is the three seed. And Lindenwood is the four seed. Who would have thought that? Those four teams that I just mentioned, they're hosting. The fifth seed is Purdue Fort Wayne. The sixth seed is Lewis. The seventh seed is McKendree. And the eighth seed is Queens. All right, now let's have a little fun. And you all can play along too. So it's time for me to predict the MIVA tournament. And I'm going to be doing this for all of the conference tournaments next week when it comes down to it. But for the MIVA tournament, Ball State versus Queens. I'm going to pick Ball State, obviously. Ball State is going to win this turn, or they're going to win the matchup against Queens. And I'm just going to say, I think Ball State's playing really good as of late. You got to give it up to Donut and Cruz. Early on, they were struggling against some of the stiff competition, but now they're looking like a lean, mean, contending machine. 
And then Lindenwood versus Purdue Fort Wayne. This is going to be a tough one. Lindenwood is playing great volleyball as of late, but Purdue Fort Wayne, they just look so tempting to take. I'm going to take Purdue Fort Wayne. I think Purdue Fort Wayne upends Lindenwood on the road. I think John Diedrich goes off. And honestly, I think Purdue Fort Wayne is probably a scary team in this tournament. Then we have Ohio State Lewis. This is Lewis is so much better than they were last year. But Ohio State, I think, is playing better as of late. I feel the Buckeyes with Jacob Pasteur healthy, or at least close to healthy, is basically a threat to everybody. I'm taking Ohio State over Lewis. And then we have Loyola Chicago hosting McKendry. All right, now, you could probably be tempted to taking Loyola, but honestly, I think Loyola is the better matchup. I think Loyola... Now, consider this. McKendry, you're all thinking, well, Loyola could probably be the best and most tempting one to win the whole thing, right? Well, you got to remember last year. McKendry took down Loyola in five sets in the first round of the MIVA Conference Tournament. Now we get this matchup again. Do I trust Loyola to winning this matchup against McKendry? Yes. I'm going to trust Loyola to win against McKendry. I think the Ramblers have a whole lot more going on for them. It's not just Parker Van Buren pulling the weight. They've got other players carrying the load. They've got Lucas Anderson doing really well in terms of serving the ball. They have Jake Reed as a great second option. Dan Mangun is setting the offense. So I got Loyola taking down McKendry, but I will say this. I won, I think it's going five. I think Loyola takes down McKendry in five. And then for the quarter fi- or the semifinals, I'm taking Ball State to win over Purdue Fort Wayne. I feel Ball State is still playing some darn good volleyball. And even though John Diedrich is a beast of a player and you never know what you can get when it comes to these in-state rivalries, I think Purdue Fort Wayne just does not have a lot in the tank. I think what hurts them is that they'll be on the road and I feel that Ball State just has that it factor. And they're playing really good volleyball as of late. Then we have Loyola Chicago, Ohio State. Now this is a very intriguing matchup. One could say that Loyola is probably the tempting pick, but you also have Ohio State, who I had very high hopes for, and everyone had high hopes for. I'm going to pick Ohio State just because Ohio State has so much more firepower. I think Loyola Chicago is good, but they can only go as far as Parker Van Buren takes them. I mean, I know I just said they have a lot of other firepower and young talent that is going to be stepping up, but I will just say... I think Ohio State has the experience factor on their team. So I'm taking Ohio State over Loyola Chicago. And then for the MIVA championship, I would have Ball State and Ohio State. Now, this is attempt this is really tough just because the two have split their matchups between one another. Ball State won the first meeting and then Ohio State wound up sweeping the second one. This is so tempting. But you know what? I'm picking Ohio State to win this tournament. I think Ohio State comes out on top over Ball State in the set, in the uh, final. And I think Ohio State clinches the automatic qualifier from the MIVA. Again, I'm, I'm basing this off of experience and firepower that Ohio State has. But I will just say, I think Ohio State has the it factor. And I think all that experience is really going to come into fruition when it comes to this big matchup. I know they've had their ups and downs, but so has every team in the MIVA, including Ball State. They've had their ups and downs. So, And Jen B is happy that I picked Ohio State. So, yes, I-O. She says O-H, and I say I-O. But who do you all think is going to win the MIVA tournament? Just let me know when it comes to like the comment section. Heck, even... Tell me in terms of, in ter- like, at me on X, formerly known as Twitter, and maybe message me on Instagram saying you're basically telling me your predictions for the MIVA tournament in terms of, like, the quarterfinals, semifinals, and the championship. And heck, I'll even give you a shout out, maybe hook you up with some ice sports radio swag. But that's going to do it for this week's episode of Set Point. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to drop the beat. Because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in to Set Point. 
I hope you all enjoyed today's show, and I really appreciate you all tuning in. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any place, anywhere, I appreciate you. Shout out to the chat room. Jen B, Marcus, Los, Great, Patty Bax, Larry B popped in for a little bit. He said T-Rod. Ralph Kalitz also popped in. Ricky Keeler popped in. Mike Pat. Mo Patios also popped in as well. I appreciate you all tuning in, and I appreciate everybody for all of their support. Remember, if you want to support Setpoint on Spreaker, you you are more than welcome to donate $5 a month, and that's how you'll be able to get access to all of the exclusive content from Setpoint. I'll see you all probably on Sunday for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Have a great rest of the week. Enjoy the volleyball action, and I will see you on Friday at UC Irvine. Peace!